couple different streaming services here. We are live across uh, a couple different platforms today. We got Money Mythbusters, got Nate joining us back here again. Nate, happy Friday. How are you? Happy Friday, Alfred. Yeah, it's uh, I got a topic today that uh, we want to uh, discuss, and it's about investing again, and it's about FANG stocks. And if you don't know what FANG stocks are, the acronym, don't worry, we'll get into that in just one second. Uh, but uh, first, if, because we are talking about uh, investments, we're going to run through our disclosures. And of course, uh, we are a financial planning firm at Diversified Capital. Uh, but in our streams and in, in our conversations uh, today, uh, nothing that we discuss is more on the personal level, of course, right? This is a broader education uh, um, segment. And uh, if you're looking for the individualized financial advice, feel free to contact us. We're happy to help with that. Uh, and as we discuss uh, the topic around investments, uh, of course, it's something as well that we're not trying to solicitate you to buy any products or buy anything stocks, right? It's about the idea of investing and the education behind it. Uh, and of course, if we tax, touch upon any tax topics, it's going to be something where we, of course, are talking about it from a broad level education basis. Uh, those are things that we often refer to tax professionals and tax preparers for those specific questions. And so should you. OK. Uh, all right. So thanks, stocks. It's been I mean, look at this year, right? The, the, the Nasdaq is high flying, even with. Uh, the the you know uh, pandemic and the different things going on around the world, the stock market itself just looks crazy, and I think that's a sentiment that is echoed right by all of our clients and people that we talk to. So the myth today that we want to touch upon is to say, Fang stocks, which Nate explained to us in a second what Fang stocks are, right? That those are the things that we should only invest in and and nothing else. Okay, so tell us a little bit, Nate. What are FANG stocks and, and what's your take around investing in them? Yeah, so FANG is an acronym, right? It stands for a handful of individual stocks. Originally, it was for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Some individuals uh, decided to add Apple into it. Obviously, Apple has been a tremendous grower and the biggest market cap in the entire investing universe. So it's double A. Uh, so Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Now, if you take the collection of those five companies, we're talking high billion, low trillion dollar companies. <laughs> so whether you know it or not, you're probably investing in things stocks already. And so if we talk about market cap, it's the total value of uh, investment or total value of the stock market, the total value of the S&P 500, which tracks 500 of the largest companies in the US is 30 and 30 and a half trillion dollars. Now, of that $30.5 trillion value of the S&P 500, the FANG stocks represent about five and a half of that. So FANG actually represents 18% of the S&P 500 because these companies have become enormous. And so again, whether you know it or not, if you just passively invest in the S&P 500, you're investing 18% of your money in the FANG stocks. Yeah. And so as they go, they're going to obviously dictate the performance of the S&P 500 quite a bit. And I don't think people realize that. I think when you say, I think it surprises us sometimes as we look at these numbers, because mm -hmm. we, we look at the markets all the time, we look at these stocks, but things grow over time. I mean, over the past decade, and you'll say this, like how much they've grown uh, to think that if I'm investing in an S&P 500 index fund, I'm 18% invested in the FANG stocks. That's a number that I don't think many people are going to, to realize, but it's something we talk about because that exposure that you have already almost a fifth of your portfolio, if it's just S&P, is in those stocks alone, okay? And that's only 1% of the 500 stocks. We're literally talking five companies out of 500. So 1% yeah. of the stocks that make up the index represent almost 20% of the entire index. That's just how massive those companies are. And they became that massive because, well, they grew tremendously over the last decade, right? So if we just look at gross performance, Facebook's over 600% in the last 10 years. Apple's almost 1,500% in growth. Amazon's 2,200%. Netflix, over 5,600% growth, which is insane. Google's lagging a little bit. Poor Google, they're at 420% growth. <laughs> oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> the total of them on average, we're talking over 2,000% growth in the last 10 years versus the S&P at just over 200% growth. So 10 times the growth 
And so, yeah, it kind of makes sense that they've become such a concentrated percent position of the S&P 500. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to look that same exact way for the next 10 years, but that's the performance of what we have seen in the past 10 years. Yeah. And, 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 and here's the thing, right? I mean, if you look at that number, it's 10x the S&P return. And keep in mind, S&P has done really well in the past decade too, right? Like, and that's- Extremely. <laughs> you're comparing something that's done really well in the past decade and these five stocks have done 10 X that. So certainly the argument has been, if I have invested in that, I would have done really well, but look, let's talk about volatility a little bit, right? In each one of those stocks, Nate, I think you can name a certain scenario in each one that they've fluctuated. Right. And, and that's part of the issue. If you're just investing in these five stocks. Yeah, totally. I mean, we can go down the list. Facebook with their Cambridge Analytica scandal, seeing Mark Zuckerberg pulled in front of Congress, that definitely shot Facebook, I think, at 200 at the time, down to 140. Apple, sadly, when Steve Jobs passed away, that was pretty catastrophic. Or even going back to the maps fiasco, that was pretty damaging to Apple. Amazon, for the longest time, didn't report any profits, and so they were kind of under for a while, not growing as great. Netflix with their DVD business being spun out earlier in the decade. Again, just so many instances. Google with their massive fines out of Europe. I mean, there's so many instances where you're going to see a lot of volatility in these stocks. And by the way, as great as those companies have grown, only two of them actually make the top 20 as far as best performing stocks in the last decade, Amazon and Netflix. So we are still talking about other uh, companies that have beaten these performers that you could have maybe invested in as well. So uh, as great as they have been, they're not the best five performers in the past decade. Only two of them make the top 20. Yeah. And, and, and if, you, if you think about that, I think the, the thing that we talk about, about volatility, I mean, we've, we've talked about this in the past in, in, in Money Mythbusters or other webinars that the way that we, we uh, account for risk or talk to clients about risk, it's always aligning that portfolio with what your, your long-term goals, short-term goals, basically what is the goal of that account? And you know, if, if the goal of that account is, hey, Alfred, hey, Nate, I just wanna be aggressive. I wanna invest in things I know. I'm in the Bay Area. I know these five companies, sure. And you would have did 10 times the S&P. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think if you think about your overall portfolio, are you going to be able to hold on to these stocks for this longer term time period without looking at it? Is that in your personality to do so? And so much of that is, is, is financial planning actually, right? It's financial planning by analyzing what the client's emotions are when you're investing. And as much as you talk about not trying to have emotions in investing, guess what? I think everybody underestimates, severely, severely underestimates their own emotions when it comes to investing. And it's not about a, 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 a pitch to say active or passive. I'm just saying clients in general will be like, yeah, market timing doesn't work. Like they'll tell me that. I'll probably like, yes, it doesn't. And then I'll get an email. I'll be like, Alfred, markets look like they're down. I'm scared. Should I pull out? I mean, that's market timing. And inevitably, inevitably that's the emotions, I think, coming back through. And I think it's good to address that, right? Which is these stocks have volatility. Their emotions are going to be playing a part in it. How, how much can you actually just close your eyes and not look at that? I think that takes a lot of guts, to be honest. I mean, when things are going really well, they're really great. But when things are not going well, it's like your world is falling apart. Yeah. I mean, I have, a, I have someone that is heavily invested in Tesla. And when Tesla hit 2,500, it's like, oh man, we're gonna be looking at that two and a half, $3 million house. That's gonna be so awesome. And guess what? They shed a third of their portfolio over the last couple of weeks because of just profit taking or maybe missing out on the S&P 500 or whatever it might be. But now they're like, oh, should I just sell everything at this point? Because it's fallen so much. So it's like, it's really hard for people to take those profits, but it's really easy for them to sell when things are down, which is the exact opposite of what want. you should be doing yeah yeah and 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 I, I don't think any of our viewers maybe 2020 if you've been invested in these stocks certainly would have taught you something about your own personal uh, uh trading habits you go back to any time 2018 december was another one right i mean that was really brutal in the markets apple was down something like what 30 percent right. in in just a couple yeah. months and so yeah. you know 
I, I think looking at returns and looking at data is really easy to be like, I should have been in these. But the reality is most people don't have the actual risk tolerance to be in them. And if you do, good for you. But I'm just saying, I think for most of what we talk, the people that we talk to or, or even friends and family, I don't, I don't think they actually have the tolerance to see it all through, um, at least for a majority of their portfolio, right? If you, if you take out a little bit of money, that's your play account. That's awesome. Like that's where the learning happens and that's, that's good to have. But a majority of portfolio, again, should be diversified. Even if it's aggressive, that's okay. But if you're across hundreds of stocks, not five stocks, it lowers the chance that you get your emotions involved and then all of a sudden make a decision that is really difficult, which is selling of March 23rd in this year. And that was at the mm -hmm. bottom because you thought it was going to fall further. Guess what? That has happened with people, right? That we talked to, that they talked to us afterwards, like we sold, now what do we do? And that's a much, much harder decision to say, when do we get back in? I mean, that's a whole different topic about market timing, but just shows you that I that, that emotional aspect of investing is very much an aspect, right? It's very important point to try to, to tackle in on. And I think maybe just to speak specifically to the FANG stocks, I mean, these are for the most part trillion dollar companies at this point. It's going to be really challenging for them to get to 3 trillion, 5 trillion, 10 trillion, for them to experience similar level of returns from this point forward, because they're so massive. I mean, I imagine so many people have Netflix subscriptions already. I mean, are there really that many more people that Netflix can reach? Maybe. But then from there, what do they do? Just continue to increase costs? And so it's just more challenging for these companies to see similar rates of return going forward. So I wouldn't expect the next 10 years to look like the last 10 years. And you hear that all the time in just general investment advice. But if you are trying to find those next thing stocks, you're probably not talking trillion dollar companies. You're talking low billion dollar companies, smaller size companies that have the ability to grow into 10 times uh, revenue or, or 10, 10 times market cap from here. Um, so just because that has been a really strong performer doesn't mean that it's going to continue to be the case. And I, I would say it's probably less likely with them already being such massive, massive companies at this point. And, 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 and to, to echo on that, it's, it's, it's all relative, right? Like they might still, from a relative standpoint as a tech stock, be a staple in a lot of portfolios, just as we talked about 18% of it being an S&P. It's a staple of these investments. Um, but potentially, if you're looking for growth, right, that's what Nate's saying. If you're looking for the growth aspect of it, that's, you know, that, that's probably not where we're looking for the next 10 years, right? It's probably just part of core yeah. positions, uh, but you should still have other positions or simply knowing that if I invest in S&P 500 index fund, I already have 18%. So I'm good with that, right? That's okay. Um, so to summarize here, right? Past 10 years, they have outperformed. That is true. They have outperformed the S&P by 10x, right? Over 2,000% that they've returned. Yet in that time, right? In that time, only two of them have made the top 20. So again, not it's people group them together, but only two of them, Amazon and Netflix, have made the two, top 20 performance. And don't forget about your own emotional tendencies when you invest. And you might not know that today, right? You might not know that for the next year or two years or until you start investing. But I encourage you, as you're starting to invest, right, that is definitely something where you need to keep uh, uh, track of, which is how are my feelings when the market is down? Do I really want to push myself to sell? Or am I already in a position where I'm thinking about where my cash is to buy? That's how you learn about your own risk tendencies. And that's something definitely that you should watch out for. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Another segment of Money Mythbusters. We're excited uh, to keep doing these. Uh, and we look forward to having you guys next week. All right. Take care. Have a good weekend. Take care.